All right, greetings and good morning, saints, pilgrims, and the flock of God, led by the true shepherd, Jesus Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied to you through the mercy of God and the redemption of the Son. It is good to gather together to worship God on his holy day, which he hath appointed for his praise and honor and for the benefit of our souls. Truly, on no other day is grace given in such degree than on that day which God is pleased to make his word known in the church. A Puritan minister wrote, The thing I would have you now observe is that the commandment of keeping the Sabbath was not abrogated with the ceremonial law, but is purely moral, and the observation of it is to be continued to the end of the world. Where can it be shown that God has given us a discharge from keeping one day in seven? Why has God appointed a Sabbath? One, in respect to himself. It is requisite that God should reserve one day in seven for his own immediate service, that thereby he might be acknowledged to be the true and great plenipotentiary or sovereign Lord, who has power over us both to command worship and appoint the time when he will be worshipped. And therefore, as he is sovereign Lord, great and glorious, let us come before him today in worship, for that he is glorified by the praise of our lips. Psalm 8 verses 1 and 2 says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. God perfects praise by the mouth of babes, even those small in faith, for a weak faith may latch on to a strong Christ, which gives us great confidence before him who are of age and full grown, able to stand and dispute in the faith. Therefore, whether weak or strong, young in the faith and old, let us come before him with purity and simplicity of heart, praising him for his great work of redemption. And therefore, let us pray. Our holy and righteous Father, eternal and unchangeable, merciful, compassionate and faithful, full of all justice and righteousness, and who will not acquit the guilty, we do come before thee in solemn reverence and true humility, acknowledging thy incomprehensible greatness, holiness, excellency, and majesty, in whose presence we do now in a special manner appear, as well as our own vileness and unworthiness to approach so near unto thee in worship. We freely confess that apart from the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would be justly cast from thy sight, for we admit our guilt, pollution, and utter inability to the right performance of so great and monument a work, apart from thy free and unmerited grace. And therefore, because of this, because by thy word we are convinced that thou art merciful and gracious in Jesus Christ to the brokenhearted and humble, and do equip thy servants for their calling by thine own virtue, we do beseech thee to pardon our weakness, assist us in the performance of the work, and accept our worship for the sake of Christ in the whole service here to be performed. And we do pray for a special blessing on that particular portion of thy word here to be read in the assembly of the saints, whom thou hast called thy special possession and thy little flock. We pray for blessing only in the name and through the mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our prophet to teach us, our priest to intercede for us, and our king to rule over us. Amen. All right, continuing on our devotions on the Psalms. Uh, we have now reached Psalm 23, um, a very famous psalm among the psalms uh, for its brief um, and concise declaration of the comfort that the Christian receives from God. Uh, it is important to note that the Christian does not receive comfort from the things of this world, as it were, although he may be refreshed by them, uh, take a measure of delight in them, and thank God for them. Uh, and yet, his comfort being not of this world, this psalm is absolutely not applicable to the sinner. The sinner cannot say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, because God is not his shepherd, and the chief thing that we receive from God is grace, and not the things of this world. And therefore, uh, when the uh, heretical or um, cheesy evangelistic 
uh, types use this psalm and say that they are comforted by it, as we will see also in the exposition. It is all vain sentiment. It is not true comfort because true comfort comes from the word of God, as we shall see as this psalm is summarized in a very important New Testament verse. And this New Testament verse being read in light of this psalm and this psalm being read in light of that verse, we will see that it comes to light just as um, the analogy of faith is that scripture interprets scripture and Psalm 23 does not have an isolated meaning as many would take it that uh, they do not want to delve into the judgmental parts of scripture but they want to read the Psalms and especially Psalm 23 and then the pastors of today's church justify them and call them Christians or call their intentions pious or um, they call them devoted and they call them, uh, they say that they are pursuing a love for Christ when, in fact, because they do not believe the Word of God as a whole, as we have seen many times in the Reformers, especially in Martin Luther's works, um, that the Word of God as a whole is to be believed and not just particular verses. As I believe it is Augustine who said, um, if you like, certain passages of scripture and not others it is not scripture you like but yourself and therefore this is applicable here when psalm 23 is used and abused not in such a sense as it is twisted to a, um, be applied to uh, in a false manner as second peter 3 9 is abused and uh First Timothy 2 4 and John 3 16 it is not abused in the same sense although whether we abuse it in one sense or another uh, it is all sinful and unlawful but this is abused in the sense that it applies to sinners which it does not and therefore that is the first lesson to be learned in Psalm 23 that the sinner that is those who are still in their sins who are not regenerate who are not repentant who do not know Christ according to sound doctrine they have no portion with the saints, and they cannot receive true comfort in the word from Psalm 23. And therefore, if we are to receive comfort from the word, then that comfort must be based on the word, and we must believe the word, not one portion only, uh, which brings some sort of sentimental value to our lives, but the whole of scripture, whether it condemn or approve of us, for that is the first element of repentance and confession that we are condemned and therefore accept that we know we can are condemned in the sight of God according to the law according to his word then we cannot be comforted by the promise of the gospel and therefore this is a gospel psalm a Christ centered psalm and not a psalm that is full of sentiment for those who do not believe in Christ and so while this psalm is utterly unavailable to unbelievers, it is a psalm of great comfort to the Christian. And Christians who do believe in Christ may receive comfort from it, as they do from other portions of the scripture as well, and not Psalm 23 only. And so we're going to read Psalm 23, which is only six verses. There's an exposition, an excellent statement by Calvin, and then also a brief summary of the psalm by Henry. Uh, but Matthew Henry also has an excellent statement in that Um introduction. So the Geneva prefaces Psalm 23 with, because the prophet had proved the great mercies of God at diverse times and in sundry manners, he gathereth a certain assurance, fully persuading himself that God will continue the very same goodness towards him forever. Psalm 23, a Psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou dost anoint mine head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever." Now in the previous psalm, we beheld David as a suffering servant, crying out in great extremity and agony for relief and assurance. We see from this, the only relief in all of our adversity is the presence of God, 
as David says again and again in the psalm, that is Psalm 22, be not far from me. For even if we are beset by innumerable evils, yet if God be with us and his presence guide us, we may progress in confidence and hopeful assurance. And so at last, when the sun of righteousness shines on us, we are speedily delivered from all evil. Therefore, to be forsaken by God and lose his comfortable presence is the greatest affliction the Christian can experience. Thus, we have a suitable preface for this psalm, which is one of comfort and delight in the favor of God. As we have read before, For his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Note that the favor of God is life, which is only experienced by those who truly believe and trust in God for righteousness. For if we trust to ourselves for sustenance and the world for delight, then can we never say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But rather, I have of this world, and I do not want, with no promise of certainty or stability. As it is written, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. And again, riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. Showing the contrast between the vanity of this world and the stability of a clean conscience through justification. Therefore, except we be justified by faith, we cannot experience the favor of God as David doth in this psalm, and cannot say with any certainty, I shall not want. For although this psalm is used and read and praised by many, it is understood only by those who know the Lord through the knowledge of his doctrine. How useless it is to say you are comforted by the word of God when you don't believe the word of God. All of the comfort that the world receives even from such words as the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want is mere sentiment and not being based on sound doctrine is vain boasting and is offensive to God. Paul says in Romans, therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. By faith, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, wherein this psalm is gloriously summarized and the substance thereof made known. For who can say, he shall not want, but he that knoweth he shall live forever? And who can be confident in this, but he that knoweth that he is just in the sight of God? And how are we justified, but by faith apart from works? Therefore, we see clearly why this psalm ends on such a note as, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For even as the beginning of the Christian life is justification, resulting in peace with God, the end thereof is glory. As Thomas Watson also writes, Grace is glory in the bud, and glory is grace in the full flower. Glory is nothing but the consummation of grace. Calvin also writes on this psalm most excellently, Although God, by his benefits, gently allures us to himself, as it were, by a taste of his fatherly sweetness, yet there is nothing into which we more easily fall than into a forgetfulness of him, when we are in the enjoyment of peace and comfort. Yea, prosperity not only intoxicates many, as to carry them beyond all bounds in their mirth, but it also engenders insolence, which makes them proudly rise up and break forth against God. Accordingly, there is scarcely a hundredth part of those who enjoy in abundance the good things of God who keep themselves in this fear and live in the exercise of humility and temperance, which would be so becoming. For this reason, we ought the more carefully to mark the example which is here set before us by David, who, elevated to the dignity of sovereign power, surrounded with the splendor of riches and honors, possessed of the greatest abundance of temporal good things, and in the midst of princely pleasures, not only testifies that he is mindful of God, but calling to remembrance the benefits which God had conferred upon him, makes them ladders by which he may ascend nearer to him. By this means, he not only bridles the wantonness of his flesh, but also excites himself with the greater earnestness to gratitude and the other exercises of godliness, as appears from the concluding sentence of the psalm, where he says, I shall dwell in the house of Jehovah for a length of days. In like manner, in the 18th psalm, which was composed at a period of his life when he was applauded on every side, by calling himself the servant of God, he showed the humility and simplicity of heart to which he had attained, and at the same time openly testified his gratitude by applying himself to the celebration of the praises of God. 
Under the similitude of a shepherd, he commends the care which God in his providence had exercised toward him. His language implies that God had no less care of him than a shepherd has of the sheep who are committed to his charge. God, in the scripture, frequently takes to himself the name and puts on the character of a shepherd. And this is no mean token of his tender love towards us. And this is a lowly and homely manner of speaking. He who does not disdain to stoop so low for our sake must bear a singular strong affection towards us. It is therefore wonderful that when he invites us to himself with such gentleness and familiarity, we are not drawn or lured to him that, may we re that we may rest in safety and peace under his guardianship. But it should be observed that God is shepherd only to those who, touched with a sense of their own weakness and poverty, feel their need of his protection, and to willingly abide in his sheepfold, and surrender themselves to be governed by him. David, who excelled both in power and riches, nevertheless frankly confessed himself to be a poor sheep, that he might have God for his shepherd. Who is there then amongst us who would exempt himself from this necessity, seeing our own weakness sufficiently shows that we are more than miserable if we do not live under the protection of this shepherd? We ought to bear in mind that our happiness consists in this, that his hand is stretched forth to govern us, that we live under his shadow, and that his providence keeps watch and ward over our welfare. Although, therefore, we have abundance of all temporal good things, yet let us be assured that we cannot be truly happy unless God vouchsafe to reckon us among the number of his flock. Besides, we then only attribute to God the office of a shepherd with due and rightful honor when we are persuaded that his providence alone is sufficient to supply all our necessities. As those who enjoy the greatest abundance of outward good things are empty and famished if God is not their shepherd, so it is beyond all doubt that those whom he has taken under his charge shall not want a full abundance of good things. David therefore declares he is not afraid of wanting anything because God is his shepherd. Another important thing to note, which I think is worthy, which is also worth going back to, um, if you want to go back on the Fearless Puritan website and look at the expositions and compare them with Calvin, for the most part, although there are some times and there are exceptions to this, for the most part, um, the exposition is written and then after that, Calvin is read and studied, and if anything in Calvin... Um, changes the course of the exposition, then brief edits are made. But what I think is amazing is how frequently the exposition matches exactly what Calvin writes. And this repetition is useful um, because um, it is not superfluous to repeat the same things over again, especially when it is our own exposition and then also compared with Calvin, because we mean to show that we are in a perfect agreement with the reformers. And so uh, this exposition on Psalm 23 uh, was written and then afterward Calvin was read and Calvin was commented upon. Um, and this shows a profound agreement that we have with the reformers, uh, which is not necessarily surprising to us, but as it is um, part of the miracle of faith, as God gives us faith to believe his word, that same word uh, that the reformers believed, this is a matter of encouragement to us, uh, that this exposition on, on Psalm 23 is in perfect agreement with what Calvin states after, uh, that those only are, as uh, Calvin writes here, it should be observed that God is a shepherd only to those who, touched with a sense of their own weakness and poverty, feel their need of his protection, and who willingly abide in his sheepfold and surrender themselves to be governed by him. Now, Calvin's statement, while it is uh, ecclesiastical and personal, is in perfect agreement with our statement regarding those who would say that they are comforted by God by it, and yet are not justified by faith, which is in the theological and the absolute. And so while we commented on the theological um, concerning justification and the doctrinal, Calvin speaks of it in the ecclesiastical and um, in the personal. That is, they feel their poverty and surrender themselves to be governed by him. That is, that according to God's providence, they surrender themselves to God and his church, as he says here, that willingly abide in his sheepfold. And therefore, this is a reminder that the reformers, again, it is not only ourselves, but the reformers who have, who 
uh, centralized the importance of the church, although during their time, you can see that during the time of the Roman Catholic Church and the corruption, there was a time uh, where it was tempting, there was a temptation to overthrow all semblance of ecclesiastical authority because there was so much abuse in ecclesiastical authority. But because the scripture does not approve of us overthrowing all ordinances that are used by hypocrites because we see in the Reformed Church today that there are still many churches who have an, a pure um, and acceptable order of worship. That is, the worship begins with a greeting, with the blessing of God. Um, the scripture is read, a prayer is made, a sermon is preached, prayer is made again, and the people con uh, commune with one another after the sermon. This is not necessarily unacceptable just because those who are in the church today are hypocrites. And so you can see that the reformers did not throw out everything as the Anabaptists did, taking to such extremes as to overthrow all church order, but Calvin in other places as well, although this is more a... Um, contextual instance of his using it. There are other places as well that Calvin and the Puritans uh, centralized the importance of um, worship in the church amongst the people of God. And the importance here, Calvin says, of surrendering, surrendering ourselves to God and being members of his flock. And therefore, we can see this excellent statement by Calvin and the perfect agreement of Calvin's exposition and our own, that being justified by faith, we have peace with God, which is the true comfort in the word, to believe the word of God. And therefore, um, it may be beneficial to go back and to read these expositions again in the light of Calvin's exposition and to see the agreement between them. Uh, because the exposition is written, and then Calvin is consulted also, um, and they are found to be in agreement, because we are of the same spirit as Calvin. The same spirit of God that taught Calvin to oppose the Catholics during his time it, uh, abides and dwells in us, and causes us and supports us in our opposition of the false Reformed Church today, the Calvinists, the Arminians, the whole a Catholic order as it was, that is universal, the universal church of corruption, which has departed from sound doctrine. Henry Ainsworth also says concerning the verse, the word, that is the word used for shepherd, comprehendeth all duties of a good shepherd as feeding, guiding, governing, and defending his flock. Therefore, kings also have this title and are said to feed their people. Psalm 78, 71, and 72, 2 Samuel 5, 2. Hereupon is it, it is attributed to God and to Christ feeding his church as the shepherd of their souls. As Psalm 80, verse 2, Ezekiel 34, 12, 14, and 15, Isaiah 40, 11, John 10, 11, and 1 Peter 2, 25. These are, and this is an excellent statement showing the duty and prerogative, the activity of a shepherd and a king towards his people, who Christ is as our great shepherd, leadeth us, just as says the psalm. Uh, Matthew Henry also writes as an introduction to the psalm, the psalmist here claims relation to God as his shepherd. Verse 1, he recounts his experience of the kind things God had done for him as his shepherd. Verse 2, 3, and 5. Thirdly, he infers that he should want no good thing, and that he needed to fear no evil. Verse 4, that God would never leave nor forsake him in a way of mercy, and therefore he resolves never to leave nor forsake God in a way of duty. Verse 6, in this he had certainly an eye not only to the blessings of God's providence, which made his outward condition prosperous, but to the communications of God's grace, received by a lively faith, and returned in a warm devotion, which filled his soul with joy unspeakable. And, as in the foregoing psalm, he represented Christ dying for his sheep, so here he represents Christians receiving the benefit of all the care and tenderness of that great 
and good shepherd. So that just bef as before, in this excellent statement by Matthew Henry in the previous psalm, in Psalm 22, as we related the experience to David, but also ultimately speaking to Christ, as Christ was the one forsaken of God for his people's sake, as Henry says here, as in the foregoing psalm, he represented Christ dying for his sheep. So here in this psalm, Psalm 23, he represents Christians receiving the benefit of all the care and tenderness of that great and good shepherd. So that as we have in Psalm 22, as it were, the doctrine of the atonement, Christ suffering on behalf of his people. Here we have the doctrine of the comfort and the peace and assurance that we have because of that atonement. Not as the moral influence theory of the, the atonement states that Christ died as a man as an, and as an example. And when people look to that uh, great act of humility and service, they are encouraged likewise to do good works. This is not the substance of the doctrine of the cross. Although, as Christ, as our example, did in fact die and do many things that we are encouraged to do by way of example, as he is full of righteousness and virtue, and we follow in his footsteps, this is not the substance, because we cannot live according to Christ. We cannot follow him and take up our take up our crosses and suffer for him and mortify the flesh, except we be endowed with divine grace. As Christ himself says in John 3, except ye be born again, ye cannot see the kingdom of God. And therefore, if we are to see the kingdom of God and pursue Christ in the kingdom of God, it must be by grace. He must send his grace into our hearts. And if we are to be blessed with grace, we must therefore be forgiven and justified. Otherwise, God would be unjust in giving us grace and in dwelling among us and in us. How can it be said that God dwells in us except it be that we are justified persons before God? And therefore, it is said that God justifies the ungodly uh, because we must be just in his sight and that on a right basis, that is the death of Christ, if we are to partake of the goodness of God. And therefore, the doctrine of justification is absolutely essential to our understanding of Psalm 23, where David says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, which pertains to God's providence, which comes after justification. Uh, for as providence leads us to our being justified, so we cannot experience that good hand of God, except we are justified and know certainly that God is well pleased with us, which, reading Calvin, we will see that that is a main focus in his theological works, to know for certain that God is propitious toward us. If you read his Institutes, you will see that he mentions it over and over and over again, that we cannot be persuaded of anything um, as pertaining to the Christian religion, except we be persuaded that God is has a fatherly care towards us, which is the doctrine of justification. And so, this is an excellent statement by Henry, as Henry states, as in the foregoing psalm, he represented Christ dying for his sheep, so here he represents Christians receiving the benefit of all the care and tenderness of that great and good shepherd. And therefore, coming to Christ as to our great shepherd and teacher of the church, let us submit ourselves to his doctrine and continue steadfast in worship to his name and prayers for his people on earth. And therefore, before we begin, let us pray. Our faithful and righteous Father in heaven, thou who art the author of truth and the God of justice, thou hatest lies and vanity and lookest with contempt on the vain superstition of the world. The men of this world, even in that which is called the church, have made for themselves gods of their own devices to bow down to and worship, that they may impose their own laws upon men's consciences. But thou, O Lord, art true and faithful. Thou art not worshipped by men's hands who are ignorant of thee. Thou seest their inward being and find them wanting, for they are without faith. Thou in perfect righteousness hast rejected the hypocrite and taken delight only in the sincere worshippers of thy name. We have seen the doctrine and behavior of thy people displayed throughout history and to attach ourselves to them by confessing the same and living according to thy commandments. 
Therefore, as we are thy church, small and scattered as ever of old time, continue to preserve us as a loving and gracious Father. Keep us from all evil, and establish us in the faith, that we may do battle against the evils of this present age. For the men of this world are full of malice and hatred for thy doctrine. Keep us from evil by the sanctification which cometh from the word of God, and make us holy as thou art holy, that we might be worthy of communion with thee. For we are brought closer thereby to the kingdom of glory. Bring the schemes of the wicked upon their own head, and save us from all our troubles. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our glorious Redeemer, in whom alone we are blessed and have peace. Amen. All right, continuing on our lessons on John Fox's um, introductions to his Acts and Monuments, uh, we have um, taken a side quest, as it were, from our main purpose to exposit the sound doctrine in Westminster. Um, but unlike the hypocrites of our age, I mean in particular, as you can um, as you can see, uh, John Gerstner's exposition of the Westminster. It is very brief brief and superficial. It is shallow. Um, there is um, so much lacking in it, even from an academic uh, viewpoint. Uh, we do not mean to rush through the Westminster Confession, get right into the doctrinal substance, and then finish as quickly as we can. But our goal is to teach sound doctrine. And as there are two introductions to the Westminster Confession, we do not wish to move past them so quickly as to leave them in darkness and oblivion, as they have been left. Because as we are in agreement with the Reformers and the Puritans, and they have written these two introductions for our benefit to prepare us for the Westminster Doctrine, and as in these statements they centralize the focus of catechization and um, godly parenting and teaching the next generation, so it would be unacceptable for us to go straight into the Westminster Confession itself and pretend that we believe its doctrine without first expositing these two documents. And as we have chanced upon this blessed document as well, Fox's Acts and Monuments, and upon reading these two introductions to this work, I thought it good to exposit these two works as well, these two, the introduction to this great work by John Fox. And as John Fox was a historian rather than a theologian, and he has excellent statements regarding the very identity of the church, as we shall see here, this which we shall read in this lesson is one of the most excellent statements in the history of the church concerning the identity of the church. And since the identity of the church is so assailed in our day, we can see the true focus of believers in times past, that as today the church is willing to welcome in their arms anyone who professes the name of Christ, we can see that the reformers of old did the exact opposite. That is, they called the church only those who truly believed the doctrine which comes from God. And therefore, we are different from the church today, and we wish to and to entirely separate ourselves from them. And if we have justification for it, which we know we do, but we do not take it for granted, but we declare it boldly and confidently, we do not separate ourselves from the churches today, that is, those who call themselves Reformed or even Puritan, because of small differences, because we desire uh, to worship in a different manner, as th that would be hypocritical and Anabaptist and schismatic as we are also accused of being, uh, but we think nothing of it because we know in our own heart and conscience that we separate from them for good reason. At the same time, it must be declared why we separate from them. And again, it is not because of small differences in worship or in practice. For if um, there was a church that preached the gospel of Christ purely, and yet had some small differences, as they perhaps used the New King James Bible, or they sang hymns, which some of them have um, some lyrics that are not as sound as they should be. If there were some practices within the church that were, in our own minds, either unacceptable or sinful, then we could bear with it. We would like, we would, um, um, willingly 
join ourselves to a church that preached the gospel of Christ, even despite some aberrant practices in worship and lack of purity. It is not because of small portions of corruption that we separate ourselves from the churches today, but because they bear a different gospel. And because of that different gospel, we cannot in good conscience join ourselves with them. Because the gospel of Christ separates from idolatry, and as you can see in the writings of the Reformers and Puritans, they are bold against the Roman Catholic Church. So, we conclude that except a church be bold against the Reformed Church today, the Apostate Calvinist Church, and the Arminian Corruption, and calls the Roman Catholic Church Antichrist and is willing to separate and call those unbelievers who do not hold to the pure doctrine of Jesus Christ, we do not join ourselves with them. And therefore, we mean in every place to justify our doctrine and to justify our practice in separation from the churches today. It is not rash, it is not schismatic, it is not Anabaptist or antinomian to separate from the churches today. It is godliness, it is separation from iniquity, from corruption, and those who do join themselves in communion with these churches are children of the devil, showing themselves that they desire communion with sinners rather than with the righteous, which we are not surprised at their behavior. It is not as if we are shocked that sinners desire congregation and communion with sinners, but we must say our peace against them. And we declare their abominations and corruptions as taught in the Word of God, and as the Word of God teaches purity, and as the Word of God shows that there are many times in which religion is reduced to a small number, as Abraham um, taught the religion in his family, as God even says to Abraham's credit, that is, that God was pleased by this in Genesis 18. We can go and look back at it. Genesis 18, when God declared his secrets to Abraham, where was the Presbyterian church then? Where was church order and discipline then? If they want to cling so fast to the sacraments, the physical communion with others, then, where, how, then they must also condemn Abraham because Abraham did not have a established church as well. So, the Lord speaks of Abraham in Genesis 18, and Abraham, you know, in the New Testament epistles, is called the father of the faithful. If he is the father of the faithful, then his works must have been pleasing to God. And what, what, where was religion during the time of Abraham but in Abraham's household? So, in times of apostasy, when there are no true churches uh, to congregate in, so religion exists in households. That is not to say that there is not a church of God congregated uh, in fellowship amongst themselves in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but that true religion does and can exist and thrive in households. And so it says in Genesis, uh, starting with 16, and the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, that is, uh, the angels of God, who were prepared to destroy a city of great wickedness. And looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. See the necessity of sound doctrine, and believing the word of God, and teaching your children the same. And therefore, we would be um, incomplete and lazy and... Uh, unacceptable teachers of the word if we should jump straight into the Westminster Confession without also expositing the t these two documents that come beforehand, which are the two um, prefaces to it, one being the Epistle to the Christian Reader, written by the Assembly as a whole, and the other the Epistle, or well, the preface to the Westminster Confession, written by Thomas Manton, in which he quotes another Puritan author at length. 
And as we have been studying these two documents, we have also found great benefit in the two introductions to Fox's Acts and Monuments, which is a historical document showing the uh, decay of religion in the Roman Catholic Church and um, the recovering of the gospel and the very identity of the church, showing the descent of the church is in the martyrs and those who suffered for the faith in obscurity, not always those who were well established in the golden uh, age of what is called the church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, that is uh, the false church, the synagogue of Satan, which according to the knowledge of the world, the rest of the world, was the only church there was. Imagine what it must have been like in um, uh, the Middle East or in Muslim-controlled Jerusalem, where the only Christianity they knew was a group of cru crusaders that were fighting for defense of the quote-unquote holy land, as if there was something holy in and of itself in physical Jerusalem. This type of behavior um, began with the iconoclast controversy um, in the 4th century, the 5th century, culminating up to the 7th and 8th century, in which there was an official council, and in the council, I believe it was um, 787, where there was a council um, that declared images as worthy to be venerated and worshipped, and there were um, priests and bishops and others who preached against um, the icons during the iconoclast controversy and said that images should not be venerated and worshipped but Christ only. But even amongst them there were also many divisions which said that some icons could be worshipped as the image of Christ but others could not be as other images of um, saints and other such. And this culminated into the ideal which was um, propagated and enforced on others during the time of the Crusades. That is, that the Holy Land itself was worthy of veneration. And therefore, the only Christianity that was known in the world at that time, in the 10th and 11th century, during the time of the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Crusades, was a Christianity that was militant against those that would defile the physical Holy Land, which is not Christianity, in which Pope Urban declared forgiveness of sins and indulgences towards those who partook in this physical crusade. Not to say um, that the defense of this region did not do a great, um, was not a great benefit for Europe as far as Muslim invasion, um, but as far as an expression of Christianity, it was not such. And therefore, um, there have been periods in which Christianity has been almost non-existent. And therefore, John Fox labors greatly to show the true descent of the church and what truly is Christianity, as opposed to that which is false Christianity, as we have in the church today. Um, the great majority of those who call themselves Christians are not such. They are not justified by faith because they do not have faith because they do not even know what faith is. And therefore, if you cannot properly identify faith, if you cannot properly identify the gospel, if you cannot properly identify the church, we do not call you a Christian. And therefore, even if you pretend to adhere to all of these points of sound doctrine as tulip um, and the gospel, and yet cannot properly identify the church, that is, you still congregate with those who are not of Christ and do not hold this gospel, we do not call you Christian, we do not communicate with you as if you were a Christian. And therefore, these three things are chiefly to be um, exposited, and our position on them is to be justified, because we do not take for granted any of these, any of these things, but we mean to prove our position by Scripture and by the testimony of the Reformers and Puritans, who are our chief influence, as the Reformation was a recovery of the Gospel. And then we, by this, show that the Church today, even that which calls itself Reformed, have no agreement with the reformers, and when we show them their quotes, 
we see exactly that they disagree with the reformers because they say that the reformers were not infallible. But by this, they do not mean that the reformers made some mistakes, but that they mean to distance themselves from the reformers and take upon themselves their own opinions. We do not mean to say that the reformers were perfect in every statement. There are some things that Martin Luther says that are either inadvisable or ecclesiastically um, false or impure, as Calvin um, perfected in his own writings many of the things that Luther fell short in, but according to their doctrine and according to their identification of the gospel and the church, we do not mean to separate ourselves from them, because to separate ourselves from the reformers and the Puritans on this, or at least the orthodox Puritans, just as there were many heretical church fathers, so there were some heretical Puritans, we mean to attach ourselves to them and to their doctrine because the Puritans were the most thorough in their preaching style and the Reformers were the most prolific in writing against the corruptions of the gospel. That is, the Roman Catholic Church that had corrupted herself to such an extent as to bring in um, the Mass and uh, priestly authority and the authority of the Pope and uh, indulgences and many other such abuses as auricular confession as we have before stated. There are many ceremonies within the Catholic Church that are absolutely unacceptable, so much so that the entire order of worship is impure. Not only their doctrine, but their worship is impure, and therefore they cannot be at peace with God and derive comfort from the word in a state of idolatry. And therefore, we have taken a step back um, and taken a break, as it were, from these two documents, the introductions to the Westminster Confession of Faith, and are studying the two prefaces to John Fox's Acts and Monuments. For this reason, that, as the Westminster Confession, is a document of doctrine and theology, that is, what Christians believe, as it is called a confession of faith, not a confession of superior Reformed theology, as the Reformed Church would teach today. They believe that what the Westminster Confession of Faith is not necessary to be believed for salvation, although the Westminster Divines called it the confession of faith, that is, that except you believe according to this document, you do not have faith, just as the larger catechism on justifying faith states. So, this document by John Fox, or these two pre preceding documents by Fox, concerns the identity of the church, just as we will see here. And that is what inspired me to go back and study it, because this is additional argumentation and authority. We have the authority of John Fox against the Calvinists today. And so, with every um, sermon and lesson and lecture, we have additional reason and justification for why we separate with the heretical churches today, which is essential to our comfort and edification in the Christian life. Um, because that is the substance of Christianity, to be justified by faith and to have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are to have peace, we must be assured in our conscience that what we are doing is justified. And especially something so um, drastic, as it were, as departing from that which is called the church today. And therefore, in these series of lessons and lectures and sermons, we do not only have a compendiary or a body of divinity, as it were, but we have a justification for our actions and a justification for our departure and separation from that impure church called the Reformed Church today. And there, if we did not have justification for it, we should be in great sin and um, we should be guilty of schism and tearing the body of Christ, which we take very seriously, not in word only, but also in action, uh, because we desire, above all things, to be at unity with all men, as it were. As Hebrew says, desire peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And as Galatians also says, do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. And as we are called to be at peace with all men, so we are glad to declare to them the gospel, which is beneficial to their souls, so that, if possible, we should be at peace with all men. As Martin Luther also says, 
concerning the Pope and the priests in his uh, commentary on Galatians, that if they will keep the doctrine of faith pure and entire, I will kiss the Pope's hand, as it were. But because they will not do this, and we know that we will not do this, we separate ourselves from them. Uh, Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians is an excellent statement, a doctrinal statement against the Roman Catholic corruption of the church. And if you will, would be reminded once again why we separate ourselves from the Calvinists and the Reformed Church, look no farther than Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians. It is an excellent document. It is the first and foremost document I would recommend one to read as far as the doctrine of faith is declared, the doctrine of justification by faith, and justification for separation from the Roman Catholic Church. Note, this is the two different different definitions of justification. One is justification in the sight of God, that is being made right in the sight of God, which is theological, and the second is justification as far as that we ourselves are doing that which is right in the sight of God. Our works are justified. And therefore, Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians is an excellent document. Maybe, perhaps, after expositing the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, we will think about either Calvin's Institutes or Martin Luther's um, commentary on Galatians because of its centrality and its speaking of the doctrine of faith. So, um, it is beneficial to study these things. Therefore, in our study of the Westminster Confession of Faith, it is beneficial for us to know what, where the Westminster Confession, Confession of Faith stands as far as a historical document and as the very identity of the church is at stake in our age. So, these statements by John Fox are beneficial to us and further encourage us in the Christian faith and show and give us a justification for our own actions in separating from the church today. And so, by way of introduction, as that was more of a preface, by way of introduction to the lesson today, I have a few points here on martyrdom, as the work of John Fox is on the Acts of the Martyrs, uh, because for the sake of the gospel they gave their lives for the faith, it behooves us to know and understand what is a martyr. As we have stated before, and is contained in many historical documents concerning the martyrs and in early church history, the question might be asked, what is a martyr? That is, first of all, what does the word martyr mean? It comes from the Greek, which means witness. That is, giving witness unto what? Because that is where the um, church today stops. In, I have heard many lectures on church history uh, from professors and from pastors in the church today who talk about, in their definition of a martyr, it being a witness. But that's where their information ends, because what is a witness and what do they give witness unto but the truth? And what is the truth but the truth of the gospel? That is, not a false gospel, not simply believing that Jesus physically died and was buried and rose again because in the church today, this does not bring contention with the false church. Just as in the early days of Christianity, they suffered for simply being a Christian, that is not where we suffer persecution today. We do not suffer persecution simply for the name of Christianity, but for the activity of Christianity. For there are many Christians, or many so-called Christians today, who suffer no persecution from the world because of their doctrine. They do not believe that they are separate from the world, and therefore their behavior being the same as the world, they gain acceptance in the world rather than persecution. But what is a martyr but one who gives witness and bears witness to the truth against the idolatry and abominations of the age? Just as Augustine says in his City of God, that the whole duty of the minister of Christ is to unceasingly rebuke sin. And is that not why we are persecuted as ministers and as the people of God, but because we rebuke sin and 
declare the abominations of this present evil world. And therefore, what is a martyr? Is it someone who simply says they're a Christian and suffers because they have the name of Christian on them? The answer is no. Jesus in Matthew 5, if we can go back and look at Matthew chapter 5, Jesus does not say, blessed are you that have the name of Christian and suffer with the name of Christian on you. Go in peace and suffer with the very with merely the name of Christianity. But he says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all men of evil against you falsely. Oh, verse 10 first. Uh, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Note that Jesus does not say in Matthew 5.10, Blessed are they which have the name of Christ and suffer um, as uh, nominal Christians. But he says... Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness sake. That is, that is the very substance of a Christian. One who is righteous and who declares the abominations and wickedness of unrighteousness. Speaking of righteousness, we can go to Romans 10, which speaks of righteousness as pertaining to whether or not we truly possess this righteousness. Romans 10. Paul writes in his great declaration of the gospel, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That is, that we are justified by faith without works, and those who add works to that faith, or even believe they are justified because of faith as a work, which absolutely abrogates and makes void the work of Christ, these go about to establish their own righteousness, and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And therefore, what does this say in Matthew chapter 5? What does Christ say to his disciples? Does he say, blessed are you when men shall revile you because you say you're a Christian? No, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. That is, those who are truly justified by faith, have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and who declare the abominations and corruptions of the false church. The false church that seeks to establish their own righteousness. The church of the Pharisees, the church of the scribes, the church of the devil, the church of the reformed today. Now, they are not reformed. We must remember that we ourselves being reformed do not mean to call into contention the very name reformed, but because the reformed church today is uh, false and teaches falsely, they join hand in hand with Arminians. And as we know, Arminianism is a subtle form of works righteousness. For if God loves all men and wants all men to be saved and gives every man the opportunity to be saved. And the man, the sinner that is availing himself of that opportunity, can either choose or not choose. Then he is justified on the basis of his choice and not on the on not on the choice of another. Because why is he justified and another is not justified? Is it God's election, God's redemption, God's Holy Spirit working in him that miracle of faith which unites him to that work? No, that is the gospel. But in the Arminian scheme, God gives grace to all men and it it is your choice whether you believe or not. And therefore, being justified in the sight of God by your own work, you must stay justified, and must continue working in order to be finally justified. And therefore, this is a a theological system that is established upon man's righteousness. And therefore, you cannot suffer for righteousness' sake, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, except you are opposed to Arminianism. And therefore, as the Reformed Church today is not opposed to Arminianism, but is joined hand in hand with them and calls them brother and fellow Christian, they cannot suffer for righteousness sake. And therefore, this is essential to the definition of martyr. What is a martyr but one who gives witness to the truth? And therefore, Christ himself says here, concerning suffering, concerning martyrdom, as it were, because suffering suffering persecution is the prelude to martyrdom. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, he does not say, 
which is the end of it, which is the final culmination or the most profound expression of persecution, he does not say, blessed are they which are martyred for righteousness sake, but blessed are they who are persecuted because all Christians are persecuted, but not all Christians are martyred. God grants a peaceful life to many Christians so that they live and die in a, a pleasant condition, as it were. Just as we read from John Calvin, when we are in prosperity, we are liable to forget God. But David, for not forgetting God, gives God glory and blesses him and says that the Lord was his shepherd and was the author of all of his precious gifts. This is what we are reminded of of day to day in the preaching of the word that we are to bless God and thank him for the many things that we receive in this life and not to take them for granted and not to become worldly but to bless God for them and to have peace in our hearts in the Holy Spirit and therefore although not all Christians are martyrs all Christians are persecuted for righteousness sake because we do not join hand in hand with wickedness and defile ourselves with their company but god will bless us and ours is the kingdom of heaven as he says here blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. What happened this very week, but that when we made a defense of sound doctrine and an execration of false churches today, we were maligned and such things that we do not believe and we do not hold to were said against us as schism and as being Anabaptist and as being antinomian and as being Brownist because there was a group during the Puritan era who thought the church was not pure enough. They were much like the Anabaptists and they separated from the Reformed and Presbyterian churches in the time of the Puritan era. But there is a historical difference between separation from the true church, which actually existed during that time and separating from the false church and therefore it must be proved whether or not a church is true and sound before we join ourselves to it such was not proved but bloviation pontification and intimidation tactics um, were used no sound arguments no proof of any purity in the church but only that christians were schismatic which is a false accusation which here Christ says blessed are ye are we surprised when men um, come at us with false accusations no because sinners will ever be like their father the devil they will lie against the truth they will lie against others in order to make themselves appear justified but we do not seek justification before men we seek to be at peace with God blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you so they maligned the false prophets they will have their portion in hell they join themselves to the false church they are not true saints to be a saint is to be pure and to be pure from all defilement in the world whether the world itself or the false church as we will see here in john fox's um, statement and so that's the introduction as to what is a martyr we could also talk about martyrdom and faith uh, it is essential for a martyr to have faith as one who is persecuted for righteousness sake belief in the word of god and sound doctrine is absolutely necessary otherwise what are we suffering for it is possible for one to suffer for the faith consequently and federally and yet not be a true christian as per perhaps a family the head of the household is persecuted and his family is persecuted with him and they suffer physical um lack because of his stance in the gospel and his children perhaps some of them being non-believers might suffer with him this is to suffer federally and consequently but this does not mean that everyone who suffers this physical persecution is a member of christ's body but faith is necessary to suffer for the sake of christ and therefore faith is central it is incumbent upon all of us to believe the word of god and to submit to his doctrine 
And therefore, we cannot be martyrs, we cannot be persecuted for righteousness in the sense that the kingdom of God is ours as the promise of the gospel, Christ saying in Matthew 5, except we believe the word of God. That is, we believe the whole word of God, just as Martin Luther writes in his commentary on Galatians. Um, that the doctrine must be kept pure and entire. Our life may be like a circle, which can be broken up or a line, but the, um, or he refers to the gospel and the doctrine of the gospel as a circle, which must remi remain perfect and entire, else it will be broken into, um, uh, something else, something corrupted, something askewed. Uh, but the uh, Christian life is not such, but there are many blemishes and spots upon our practice. As you can see in Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians, he speaks of the difference between doctrine and practice. But here we speak of faith, because faith must be pure and entire, else we cannot be rightly called martyrs for the faith. For how can we bear witness to the faith, which is absolutely necessary, ne necessary to the definition of martyr or witness? What are we bearing witness to except the faith? And therefore, if we are to bear witness to the faith and suffer for the faith, we must first have faith, which is to believe the word of God and to submit to the righteousness of God in Christ, coming to the knowledge of the law and the gospel, what the law requires of us and what we fall short of and who we are in ourselves and the relationship of ourselves as a sinner in the sight of God. For except we understand ourselves as sinners coming short of the law, which is perfection, and ourselves as the opposite of perfection, we cannot come to the knowledge of Christ. Therefore, Calvin writes in his commentaries that we cannot know God as shepherd except that we know our poverty. That is, that we see our need for God to lead us as shepherd. And therefore, faith is necessary. We can also talk about martyrdom and hope. That is, what is the expectation in a state of suffering? When we are suffering, then hope is then required because we are not in a state where we enjoy the fullness of our comfort and peace with God. But when we are in a state of affliction, the sense militates against that peace and we are in need of hope. And therefore, this hope clinging to faith, being um, founded upon faith, we are assured that our condition will be bettered, that God will restore his kindness and gentleness to us, that when we are afflicted and trouble comes upon us, we know that God will be gracious towards us. And in that state, when we are prepared to die, as the martyrs did, they were imprisoned, what hope could they have of their outward condition being bettered? Yet, they can hope for the resurrection. And that is ultimately what all Christians hope for. And therefore, our hope is one and the same of the martyrs, just as our faith is one and the same. As we will, as this is the chief reason we are going back and reading this statement by John Fox is an excellent statement because we join ourselves to the martyrs because they suffered for the faith. And as they suffered for the faith and had great hope in God, so our faith was like theirs and our hope also is like theirs. That if we suffer tribulation, we can have hope in God that he will fulfill the promises of the gospel to us, whether in life or or in death. We can also speak about martyrdom and love as faith, hope, and love. These three, the greatest of these is love. That is that it comprehends the most objects as love comprehends both God and neighbor. Faith apprehends God. Hope apprehends the resurrection, but love apprehends both God and neighbor and all things. Love is applicable in all things. That is why Paul says the greatest of these is love because it comprehends um, everything as pertaining to the Christian life. So, when we speak of martyrdom and love, we're speaking of the motive of the Christian and our willingness to part from this world to be with Christ. That is chiefly what we are speaking of when we speak of love as pertaining to martyrdom, but we are also speaking of our behavior towards those who persecute us. We are speaking of our behavior towards others our behavior towards the church, and our love ultimately for Christ and taking up his cross. As he Christ himself says, I believe it's Matthew 10, take up your cross and follow me. He that 
loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh up not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that shall find his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. This is the fullness of the love of Christ. To love Christ to the full extent to give ourselves to him. Now we must remember that although every Christian does indeed love Christ, he does not love Christ to the same degree as is perfected in sanctification. As we can see, Paul's statement in Philippians We can begin with uh, verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. Here Paul is not speaking of others preaching a false gospel, but preaching because of false motives, because it is tempting even for Christians to be swallowed up in envy, because Paul was given so many spiritual gifts. And therefore, rather than preaching because of sincerity, they were preaching in order to demonstrate their own gifts, rather than preaching Christ in simplicity. This is a temptation to preach in envy rather than preaching Christ sincerely. And therefore, Paul is not speaking speaking of those preaching a false gospel, but preaching for false motives. He's speaking of love. He's speaking of the greatest love is to preach Christ purely, not um, hypocritically and not because of envy. And therefore, Paul says, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love. We are here speaking of Christian love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Therefore, Paul is speaking to of the degrees of love. Paul, having a greater love for Christ, was able to preach Christ sincerely, whereas others, who perhaps were new, newer in the faith, but yet called to preach by Christ, they did not preach Christ sincerely, at least at the first. They needed sanctification. And therefore, they preach Christ of contention, that is, to show themselves to be more approved than Paul, which is a temptation. And therefore, they had need of being humbled and to, re to return to a sincerity in Christian love. And Paul says, but the other of love, knowing, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Therefore, those others who preached Christ, they were friends of Paul. They preached because they knew and were confident that Paul was set for the defense of the gospel. That is, Paul was chief and eminent in his gifts and in his declaration of the gospel. And then Paul says, what then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And either and do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. And therefore, because Paul's love was great, he rejoiced in the preaching even of those who contended against him. Not that they contended against his doctrine. This is not speaking of doctrine. This is speaking of love. And therefore, we can relate this to Martin Luther's comment about the doctrine must remain pure and entire, but oftentimes our love fails. But the other of love, what then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Here is shown the importance of Christian prayer, while we ask the people of God to pray for us, because it shall turn to his salvation through the prayers of the saints and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, because these work together. God works by the prayers of his people and supplies the spirit of Jesus Christ to his people by prayer. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Here we're speaking now of martyrdom and the love of Christ and the desire to depart from this world. And therefore he shall not be ashamed, and he shall in nothing be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And therefore Paul is saying here that to live is to live in Christ, and therefore to live in sanctification and holiness and for the glory of Christ. And to die is gain, because to die is to have our body separated 
or to have our soul separated from this world and to be joined with Christ in heaven, waiting for the final resurrection when our bodies also shall rise from the grave. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you, with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Note Paul's focus in all of his epistles, also in this epistle here, of suffering for the sake of Christ. It is not superfluous to continue to study the martyrs, because to suffer for the sake of Christ is the greatest expression of Christian love. And here he says he is in a strait betwixt the two, having desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So here, Paul says that he is in a strait. He has a desire to be with, to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better than this life. But he has a love for the saints also. So this is the substance of Christian love, to love God and to love his people. To His love for God drove him to desire to depart from this world. His love for the saints drove him to be a benefit for their souls and to continue on preaching and ministering grace to them by that. And therefore, in this brief passage in Philippians, we can see the evidence of Christian love in Paul. That Paul, having a love for those who preach the gospel purely, even rejoiced in their preaching, although it was in part, not in whole, not in the absolute, but in part done with some element of hypocrisy and envy, and not purely and sincerely according to motives. We recall to mind that this is not speaking of doctrine. Paul is not speaking of the doctrine of the gospel being at stake, but the motives of the preachers. He already takes for granted that they are preaching the gospel because he says the one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. And therefore, although a Christian um, varies by degrees according to Christian love, all those who preach the gospel preach it according to sound doctrine. Otherwise, Paul would not be saying that they preach Christ, but they would that he would say, as, as he did in Galatians, accursed be those who preach any other gospel. And therefore, Paul is not in contradiction with himself. And so all this, the, although this verse is used and has been ver used in times past by the Calvinist, saying that um, those who do not preach Christ purely, Paul rejoiced that Christ was preached by them. This is not speaking of doctrine. This is speaking of the motive of the Christian preacher, Christian love. And therefore, when we speak of martyrdom and Christian love, we are speaking of our willingness to part from this world to be with Christ, just as Paul says in Philippians chapter 1. We can also speak of martyrdom and mortification, that the life of the Christian consists in putting off the sins of the flesh. So the death of the Christian is the culmination of that. As the Christian life is putting off sin and putting on righteousness, mortifying the body, seeking more and more to bleed out, to eke out corruption from our bodies, that we might be pure and uncorrupt, living in Christ in holiness and purity, loving our brethren, increasing in grace and the knowledge of God, increasing in wisdom. So this assists and expedites our mortification. And so the death of the Christian is the final act, as it were, of mortification, that our body is finally put off and righteousness and eternal glory is put on forever and ever. And therefore, if we speak of mortification and martyrdom, we speak of the putting off of the flesh as the Christian is not yet perfect, but in heaven shall be made perfect. Just as uh, the Westminster Catechism says, the benefits that believers receive from Christ at death, that their souls being made perfect in holiness shall escape the corruption that is in this world. And the benefit of the Christian at the resurrection, that they shall rejoice in Christ in perfect glory forever and ever. And so this is essential for us to remember these two questions in the Shorter Catechism, 
question 37 and 38 as far as the mortification of sin and martyrdom being put to death in this life is our entrance into the next life christ has defeated death just as first corinthians 15 says you can go to first corinthians 15 as far as um, our word before on hope and the resurrection and the kingdom of glory and also on our final mortification and putting to death this body now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Here we can take great comfort that God commands us to be unmovable in the faith. That is, as Martin Luther said, my forehead shall be strong against all men's forehead. I will be unmovable as far as the doctrine of faith. If we hope for resurrection, we must remain strong in the faith unto death. Just as Hebrews 3 says, and we read from time to time concerning perseverance in the faith, God himself does supply us with grace so that we will persevere. At the same time, only those who persevere shall be saved. As Hebrews 3 verse 6 says, But Christ, as a son over his own house, was faithful, whose house are we, if we hold the fast, the confidence, and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Just as he also says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Whilst it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. And therefore, when we speak of martyrdom and mortification, it is the putting off of incorruption, uh, is the putting off of corruption and putting on incorruption. It is putting off of mortality and putting on immortality. So that death is swallowed up in victory and the sting of death is defeated. And therefore, at our death, we shall be renewed to everlasting life because that life is begun in this life. And therefore, those who are not in the faith cannot hope for a resurrection because that everlasting life is begun in this life. Even as Christ himself says in John 3, once again, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And therefore, we cannot enter in except we see the kingdom of God, and that is begun by regeneration. That is to be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. And then finally, we can talk about martyrdom and a good report. Even if we die in obscurity, a curse from the world, we are brought into our heavenly rest, and the church is encouraged by our testimony or witness. We have a good report through faith. Look at what Paul says in Hebrews 11 concerning martyrdom. Remember here we are defining the works and acts and identity of a martyr. Even if we do not give ourselves to the death, we have the identity of martyrs because we give ourselves as a witness to the faith, that faith that we believe, that word that we hope in, and we love Christ and we give ourselves to him and take up our cross daily. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. What good report does this chapter culminate into? But 
that others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. We all await the last and final resurrection, in which our souls shall be united to our bodies, our bodies being perfected by the grace of Christ, by his death and resurrection, even as Christ's body now dwells in heaven with God, his Father, so also all of the bodies of believers shall be joined to him in perfect communion forever. And therefore Christ himself says, we shall eat and drink in the kingdom of heaven, not for the sustenance of our body, but to give glory to God in Christ. And so there shall be great joy in heaven when our souls are united to Christ, and then finally our bodies are united to our souls. This will be the perfect communion that believers shall enjoy with Christ in heaven. And so, such is the introduction to what is a martyr. And so, the lesson here is titled, The Outward Beauty of the False Church, The Inward Sanctity of the True. For as we shall see in this long statement by John Fox, the identity of the church is at stake. And in this statement, you can see brilliant observations by John Fox. And it is absolutely applicable to applicable today concerning our separation from the false church. So these are the words of John Fox from his introduction to the Acts and Monuments, which is called to the true and faithful members of Christ's universal church, or Christ's Catholic church even, as it were, because the true Catholic church is that which exists in the world, which professes his name, as the Westminster Confession states, that all those who profess true religion are members of the visible church. And this is what we are speaking of, the difference between the false church, which is not even the visible church, and the true church, which is which is all of those who profess the name of Christ in tr sincerity and in sound doctrine, not according to heresy. And so, John Fox writes, now, for as much as the true church of God <clears throat> goes not lightly alone, but is accompanied with some other church or chapel of the devil to deface and malign the same, we recall to mind the words that were just recently, this week, spoken against us, the chapel of the devil defacing and maligning the same. Necessary it is, therefore, the difference between them to be seen and the descent of the right church to be described from the apostles' time, which hitherto in most part of histories has been lacking, partly for fear that men durst not, partly for ignorance that men could not discern rightly between the one and the other, who, beholding the church of Rome to be so visible and glorious in the eyes of the world, so shining in outward beauty, to bear such a port, to carry such a train and multitude, and to stand in such high authority, supposed the same to be only the right Catholic mother. The other, because it was not so visibly known in the world, they thought, therefore, it could not be the true Church of Christ, wherein they were far deceived. For although the right Church of God be not so invisible in the world that none can see it, yet neither is it so visible again that every worldly eye may perceive, may perceive it. For like as is the nature of truth, so is the proper condition of the true church, that commonly none sees it, but such only as be the members and partakers thereof. And therefore they which require that God's holy church should be evident and visible to the whole world seem to define the great synagogue of the world rather than the true spiritual church of God. In Christ's time, who would have thought but the congregations and councils of the Pharisees had been the right church? And yet had Christ another church in earth besides that, which, albeit it was not so manifest in the sight of the world, yet was it the only true church in the sight of God? Of this church meant Christ speaking of the temple, which he would raise again the third day. And yet after that the Lord was risen, he showed not himself to the world, but only to his elect, which were but few. The same church, after that increased and multiplied mightily among the Jews, had not the Jews' eyes to see God's church, but did persecute it, till at length all their whole nation was destroyed. After the Jews then came the heathen emperors of Rome, who, having the whole power of the world in their hands, did what the world could do 
to extinguish the name and church of Christ, whose violence continued to the space of 300 years. All which, while the true church of Christ was not greatly inside of the world, but was rather abhorred everywhere, and yet notwithstanding the same flock so despised in the world, the Lord highly regarded and mightily preserved. For although many then of the Christians did suffer death, yet was their death neither lost to them nor detriment to the church. But the more they suffered, the more of their blood increased. In the time of these emperors, God raised up then in this realm of Britain diverse worthy teachers and witnesses, as he mentions many of these teachers, and other more, in whose time the doctrine of faith without men's traditions was sincerely preached. After their death and martyrdom, it pleased the Lord to provide a general quietness to his church, whereby the number of his flock began more to increase. In this age, then, there followed here in the said land of Britain, many other names he here mentions, and a great sort more, which governed the church of Britain by Christian doctrine a long season, albeit the civil governors for the time were then dissolute and careless, as Gildas very sharply does lay to their charge, and so at length were subdued by the Saxons. All this while, about the space of four hundred years, religion remained in Britain uncorrupt, and the word of Christ truly preached, till about the coming of Austin and of his companions from Rome, many of the said Britain British preachers were slain by the Saxons. After that began Christian faith to enter and spring among the Saxons after a certain Romish sort, yet notwithstanding somewhat more tolerable than were the times which after followed through the diligent industry of some godly teachers which then lived amongst them and such other, who though they erred in some few things, yet neither so grossly nor so greatly to be complained of in respect of the abuses that followed. For as yet, all this while, the error of transubstantiation and elevation with auricular confession was not crept in for a public doctrine in Christ's church, as by their own Saxon sermon, made by Aeofricus, and set out in the second volume of this present history, may a page on may appear on page 1114. During this meantime, although the bishops of Rome were held here in some reference with the clergy, yet they had nothing as yet to do in setting laws touching matters of the Church of England. That only pertained to the kings and governors of the land, as is seen in this story on page 754. And thus, the Church of Rome, albeit it began then to decline apace from God, yet during all this time it remained hitherto in some reasonable order, until at length, after the said bishops began to shout up in the world through the liberality of good princes, and especially by Matilda, a noble duchess of Italy, who at her death made the Pope heir of all her lands, and endowed his see with great revenues, then riches begot ambition." Ambition destroyed religion, so that all came to ruin. Out of this corruption sprang forth here in England, as did in many other places, another Romish kind of monkery, worse than the other before, being much more drowned in superstition and ceremonies, which is about the year of our Lord, 980. Of this swarm, swarm, and he mentions many names here, Egbert, Egobert, Egwene, Boniface, Wilfred, and he even mentions Anselm and such others. And yet in this time, also through God's providence, the church lacks not some better knowledge and judgment to weigh with the darkness of those days. For although King Edgar, with Edward his base son, being seduced by Dunstane, Oswald, and other monkish clerks, was then a great author of much superstition, erecting as many monasteries as there were Sundays in the year, yet notwithstanding this did not continue long. For soon after the death of Edgar came King Ethelred and Queen Elfthred, his mother, with Alfred, Duke of Merceland, and other peers and nobles of the realm, who displaced the monks again, and restored the merry priests to their old possessions and living. Moreover, after that followed also the Danes who overthrew those monkish foundations as fast as King Edgar had set them up before. Now, although this statement goes into many of the particulars concerning the English history, the beginning of true religion in England, which culminated into the martyrdom of those blessed worthies under Queen Mary I, which I believe uh, Fox mentions, uh, which was around the same time as Fox, uh, just before, as it was, I believe, the 1520s and 30s. Fox wrote, uh, wrote this in the 40s and 50s, if I recall correctly. Um, so, he, although he goes into particulars, these chief principal heads are to be understood. This is one of the most excellent statements in all Christendom, and it would do us well to write it on our doorposts, as it were and keep it in remembrance. 
where he says, The histories have been lacking, partly for fear that men durst not, partly for ignorance that men could not discern rightly between the one and the other, who, beholding the church of Rome to be so visible and glorious in the eyes of the world, so shining in outward beauty, to bear such a port, to carry such a train and multitude, and to stand in such high authority, supposed the same to be only the right and Catholic mother. The other, because it was not so visibly known in the world, they thought, therefore, it could not be the true church of Christ, wherein they were far deceived. For although the right church of God be not so invisible in the world that none can see it, yet neither it is so visible again that every worldly eye may perceive it. For like as is the nature of truth, so is the proper condition of the true church, that commonly none sees it, but such only as be the members and partakers thereof. And therefore they which require that God's holy church should be evident and visible to the whole world, seem to define the great synagogue of the world, rather than the true spiritual church of God. In Christ's time, who would have thought but the congregations and councils of the Pharisees had been the right church, and had and yet had Christ another church in earth besides that, which, albeit, was not so manifest in the sight of the world, yet it was the only true church in the sight of God. Of this church meant Christ speaking of the temple, which he would raise again the third day. And yet after that the Lord was risen, he showed not himself to the world, but only to his elect, which were but few. The same church, after that increased and multiplied mightily among the Jews, yet had not the Jews' eyes to see God's church, but it persecuted it till at length, all their whole nation was destroyed. Excellent statements by John Fox that it is almost as much it is almost as if we ourselves wrote it. But why is this but that God gives us his Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that he gave to his servants of old, even John Fox and the reformers who separated themselves from the Roman Catholic Church, just as we separate ourselves from the heathen reformed church. And therefore, we have justification for our actions, though perhaps God will not bring about a great reformation as he did in those days, as the corruption in the churches has only just begun. Right now, they are differing in doctrine, just as the Catholic Church began in the 5th, the 6th century, the 7th, and then became more and more corrupt as the years went by, growing in superstition, perhaps God will leave the church in obscurity for the next 400 years or so. And yet we can still pray for reformation. We can still do that which God has commanded us to do as far as the advance of reformation. But as we see in these writings that they had the same experience as we do, so we can bless God for his grace to us that he has vouchsafed his gospel into our hearts and we believe that which they believed, which is separation from the world and clinging to purity through the grace of Christ. And therefore, in this lesson, we can see 10 things which are notable. First, the nature of faith. The nature of true faith is to oppose the works of the devil. As you can see, John Fox clearly saying um, that the Catholic Church was likened to the church of the scribes and Pharisees. He does not say that Catholics were fellow believers, but he says that the Catholics were not the true church, but were the synagogue of Satan. This belief is entirely disappeared from the world today. They do not say, not even the Calvinists today, say that the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan, which, of course, they, being the synagogue of Satan, they being the false church, uh, the more manifest expression of the false church today, even worse than the Roman Catholics in a sense, because Protestantism is true religion, Reformed doctrine is true religion, and yet they themselves, taking the name of true religion and putting on a false gloss, they show themselves to be separate from God and the true Pharisees, the more profound expression of the Pharisees. But they don't even call the Catholics an abomination. And therefore, how rare is true faith to oppose the works of the devil? Uh, because although many people in today's Reformed world think that there are many true and sound teachers, where are their sermons against the abominations of the world? Where are their sermons against the Calvinists, the sermons against the Arminians, the sermons against the Roman Catholics? Where are their sermons calling out the abominations of this world? I would very much like to hear them. Uh, but as I know, and I'm very confident that for the most part they don't exist, we can be confident that men lie about the nature and state of religion in the church today. And so, the nature of true faith is to oppose the works of the devil. Secondly, 
on, on this same point, faith is of God and is not of this world. As we can see that the true church of God is preserved by God and it is blessed by God, so it must be of God. Regeneration begets faith, which is agreement with God, which is his doctrine. We are in agreement, in full agreement, with that which is spoken in the Holy Scriptures. And although we are not yet sanctified as to fully understand and comprehend all of the Scriptures, and there are many implications and applications for our daily life, yet believing the substance, believing in Christ, we have everlasting life through him. And therefore, as God himself is the author of this faith, it is his word that he has declared in the Holy Scriptures, so faith is of God and not of this world, and so our behavior is immediately changed from being of God and not of this world. And I can speak this according to my own experience, that when I was first saved, what the most immediate and noticeable change in my own mind concerning my relation to the world was that I cared nothing anymore for the opinions of men, but rather for what the scripture said. As before my regeneration, before my conversion, um, I regarded the word of man and would call into question whether or not the scripture said such, except that man confirmed it, yet after conversion, the opinion of man meant nothing to me. And immediately when I came into confrontation with Calvinist pastors and they would use intimidation tactics and their own doctrine, I would immediately say, this is your opinion, this doesn't matter, where is your scriptural support? And they would become lazy. And I have another interesting story on this topic that I'm going to um, share after the discussion, as it's less theological. Uh, we'll stick uh, with the study, uh, but it's also onto the same point of Calvinist hypocrisy, of confrontation, and the opinion of man meaning nothing. And therefore, this is onto the same point of that faith is of God and not of this world. When we are truly regenerated, we are brought out of this world to rest and trust in God. This does not mean that we are now not connected with our neighbors. We are still to submit to our authorities, to authorities, to parents, to um, magistrates, to governors, to civil leaders. But it is for the sake of God. And therefore, when they come into confrontation with God and, and command that which is unlawful, which comes into conflict with faith, then we may lawfully disobey for the sake of good conscience. And therefore... This is essential to our faith, to disobey men for the sake of God, but to be in obedience to all men for the sake of conscience, because God has put them over us for our benefit. And therefore, faith is of God and not of this world. Thirdly, faith is unifying. Just as we said before, we do not seek to separate ourselves from men for the sake of separation because we, we want to appear to be better than them, as if we were a monkish sect, um, div an, a divisive unit or group that wants to be separate from everyone for the sake of separation and the sake of division. But faith is unifying. Faith is an agreement, as we see in Ephesians chapter 4. There is unity in the faith. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Ephesians chapter 4, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So just as we before spoke of Christian love, how far it encompasses all things and our behavior and actions towards others, our motives in this life. So we are called with all lowliness and meekness, not pride and presumption, not arrogance and stubbornness. We do not oppose the churches today because we are arrogant and stubborn, but with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, that is the saints, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We desire above all things to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, even as Paul says, endeavoring, that is, zealously endeavoring. Usually, and I'm, I'm very confident I have studied this word in the particular, in the Greek, usually when there is a strong word that the King James uses, like endeavoring, the Greek usually indicates a zealous endeavoring. It is a passionate endeavoring. It is more than just trying to, 
to do something, but it is zealously trying with love. Here he says, to forbear one another in love and endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is to be at peace with all Christians. As far as the faith is concerned, we are to be at peace with all men as far as our activities and life is concerned, but we are to be at peace with all Christians as far as the faith is concerned. We separate from others as far as faith is concerned. And then, before you, uh, lest you think that heretics also belong in this category, as Calvinists would say today, Arminians being welcome in this, and so they would say that we, um, separating from the church today, are not endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What does Paul say? He says, There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. If there is one faith, and these two faiths are different, that God has elected, that he has redeemed, that he is effectually called, and that he effectually preserves, and that is absolutely different from the faith that he loves all men, that he died for all men, that he wants all men to be saved, and that he leaves it up to you to decide what to do with that opportunity, as these are different faiths. Only one is the true faith. One is proved in Scripture because it gives glory to God. The other gives glory to man. We can be confident that the other is accursed. It is anathema. It is the religion of the sinner. It is the religion of natural men. It is the religion that the rest of the world already possesses, and therefore Arminians are only trying to get others to worship their false god, just as others try to get um, people to worship their false god. They are not evangelizing for the sake of the gospel, but just to prove that they are better than others and that their religion is better than others, which we can see by testing it according to the doctrine of scripture. It is not. It is a curse from God. It is execrable. If God is one, if God is absolute, if God does all things according to his counsel, which the scripture says, then it would be utterly inconsistent with this to give man such a freedom of will as to be separate from his decrees. But, as the Westminster says, although we have a freedom of the will that is not compulsed or forced, yet it is still subject to God's eternal decrees. And so, here... Um, Ephesians 4 teaches that there is one faith and that Christians are zealous in endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Who are those that separate from the church of God but those who join themselves with heretics or that have no love for the saints and do not endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? And therefore, this is an exhortation to the church to remain in Christian communion and in love towards one another because faith is unifying. So the nature of faith is to oppose the works of the devil. Faith is of God and is not of this world. Faith is unifying. And then fourthly, faith separates from ungodliness. As we before said, we not only separate ourselves from the corrupt churches that preach false doctrine as their false gloss on justification, saying that Arminians are also justified, though they do, are not justified by faith. Calvinists must be saying that they're justified by works because that is how they're justified in their mind. And therefore, Calvinists also must believe that they themselves are justified by works because there's only one way of justification. And therefore, their doctrine is full of contradiction and deceit. And they, we know, believe they're justified by works despite their profession. And we also separate from the wicked in this world. Although we have some... Um, uh, conversation and a certain degree of companionship with those who are of this world, we do not let them decide um, how we behave or how we act, and we do not join with them in their same excess of riot. If they would try to lead us into um, indulgence or luxury or voluptuous living or licentiousness, we separate from them and call them abominable idolaters. And therefore, Peter says on this, according to separation from the world in 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? 
and therefore we are to separate ourselves from the wicked in this world and to live pure and godly in the sight of God in Christ. So faith is unifying, but it separates us from ungodliness. Fifthly, an important point that we can learn from this church, this uh, uh, statement by Fox also, only those who are of the church can rightly identify the church. You can go back here and read this excellent statement where he speaks of the nature of truth. Wherein they, that is the historians and those who read these corrupt histories, were deceived. They were far deceived because they thought that the Roman Catholic Church was the only true church. They were far deceived. For although the right church of God be not so invisible in the world that none can see it, yet neither is it so visible again that every worldly eye may perceive it. For like as is the nature of truth, so is the proper condition of the true church, that commonly none sees it, but such only as be the members and partakers thereof. What an excellent statement. This is one of the most excellent statements in all of Christendom, not only of Fox and the Reformers and of the Puritans, but in all Christendom. And therefore we can derive from this the doctrinal statement that only those who are of the church can rightly identify the church. How is it that Calvinist pastors call Arminians Christians? Well, how is it? And if you recall to mind, that is that chief basis of contention that um, I've said before that if there was nothing else that they differed from us, but that they differed from us on the identification of the church, yet this is justification enough to entirely separate ourselves from them. That they call Arminians Christians, that they call those who are not just in the sight of God, true believers, they do not know the true church. Not only in the sense that they identify those who are not members of the true church as the true church, but as they cannot identify the true church as the true church. For there are antinomians in our own day and age. There is a small group of antinomians who call Arminians anathema. They call Arminians accursed, but they are just as ready to call the Puritans accursed and to say that the covenant of works is a false doctrine. And because they cannot rightly identify the church in the positive, they are also not of God. Although they profess to believe in superlapsarianism and election and limited atonement and say that those who deny limited atonement are a curse from God, which is the truth. However, they themselves are a curse from God, being antinomian and being separate from the true church of God. And therefore, they themselves gather large numbers to themselves and are not persecuted because they are not the true church. And so just as faith is unifying, it separates from ungodliness, and only those who are of the church can rightly identify the church. What a surprise. God gives us his spirit to communicate with one another, not with the world, and he does not give the spirit the, wor the word. He does not give the world the spirit to communicate with us. But we should count communication between Christians as precious because it is something that we and we alone have. Only those who are of the church can rightly identify the church and therefore have communion with the church. And therefore, what a curse it is to be a part of a church that preaches the gospel and to separate yourself from it. A curse and a thousand curses shall be upon the head of those who heard the word of God and departed for the pleasures of this world. Such we have seen is common in the world today. And then sixthly, which has to do with this point, nor can outsiders identify themselves as hypocrites. Again, what a surprise. Are we surprised that when we convict and condemn the world as apostate and the church today as apostate and the reformed and Calvinist churches as wicked and hypocritical, is it a surprise to us that they don't see themselves as hypocrites, but that they argue and defy our reasoning, which is absolutely solid and sound as is proved from scripture and the testimony of the reformers? Are we surprised that they don't believe us? Although we have scripture as our support, the reformers as our support, Augustine as our support, the Puritans as our support, their standard of preaching and the corruption that has crept into the church as our support. Are we surprised that they don't believe us despite all this? No, because sinners cannot be turned to the truth because they cannot identify with the truth. They think they are the true church, but they are hypocrites and they are the church in their own minds through their own works. And therefore, you would have to topple their entire enterprise of works if ever you, were, you hope to persuade them that they are not the true church. And therefore, they cannot 
identify themselves as the church, nor can I, they identify themselves as hypocrites. They will continue to cover over their hypocrisy and pad up works and imagine that they are justified on the basis of those works, and they will always think of those works that they have done and all of the works that others have done. It is the whole enterprise of the world and the works of the devil that is their religion that cannot be toppled over but by the hard preaching of the law which happens in the church. And if they are not under that preaching, where the law, like a hammer, breaks their hard hearts and shows them to be sinners in the sight of God, they cannot be saved. And therefore, we are not surprised at the condition of the church, we are not surprised at the behavior of others towards us, and we are not surprised that hypocrites cannot identify themselves. Those who are outside the true church, as we can read back again from Fox here, this same statement we hear read, as is the nature of truth, so is the proper condition of the true church, that commonly none sees it, but such only as be the members and partakers thereof. So just as only those of the church can rightly identify the church, nor outsiders, neither can outsiders identify themselves as hypocrites and as being outsiders. And therefore, just as we have said before, the Christian religion is not an inclusive religion. It is a covenantal religion, and it is established by families and by the preaching of God in the church. Are we offended that men don't join themselves to us in great numbers? No, because the kingdom of God is propagated through preaching and through the establishment of covenant families. And therefore, if there be one family in this world that serves God in peace and in sanctity and in holiness, it is enough for God to be pleased by his church in this world. We recall to mind the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He does not say, blessed are those who build large churches and who have large numbers and who have strict denominations and who have Presbyterian oversight. But he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He does not say where one is, that we might not think it's individualistic. Um, but he says we're two or three because the Christian community is a community of like-minded individuals. We are a people. We are a church. Where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. Uh, this does not overthrow the necessity of regeneration, that each individual must be regenerated and called to repentance in order to taste the sweetness of Christ himself in the gospel, but that as a entity, the church is covenantal and the Christian religion is covenantal, and where two or three are gathered together, there is Christ in the midst of them. Um, hypocrites cannot identify with this verse because they are not two or three, they are many, they are hundreds, they are thousands, and they communicate with each other in worldliness and in hypocrisy. And then seventhly, it is impossible for deceit to uncover itself. Again, why are we not surprised that hypocrites cannot identify themselves as hypocrites and as outsiders of the true church of God? But that deceit cannot uncover itself. They are deceived by the devil. It is a strong deceit. It is strong delusion that they are under. The delusion of the devil and the deceit that they are under is not common delusion. It is not simply whether or not um, an automobile is a dangerous thing to be driving, and if you drive carelessly or intoxicated, you are a danger and risk to, to, risk to others. This is a common delusion that happens in the world today that can be fixed by good information, that can be fixed according to ordinary counsel and um, admonition that this person is careless and they need to be taught that um, such and such is dangerous, um, or any other such things that happen and occur in this world, according to common uh, deceit and delusion, that they have deceived themselves into thinking that it's such and such is an acceptable behavior, but natural counsel and ordinary admonition may recover them out of it. We are not speaking of such common deceit and delusion as some are in today, that they make themselves a danger to themselves or others, or even perhaps dietary laws in food, whether or not this is the, one of the most common mistakes in society, especially in America, concerning um, fats and oils and greases and sugars and what is healthy and what is unhealthy, because men commonly are given to unhealthy um, dietary practices. 
This is common delusion. This is not necessarily the work of the devil in their mind, but this is that which is common and misunderstood among men because the deceit of the media and the consumerism that is in America and the materialism drives them to seek after immediate pleasure. And therefore, this is a common delusion. But the delusion and deceit that men are under today in the church is not common delusion. It is this deceit of the devil. It is strong delusion, and he holds them captive by it. They are ruled and um, they are enslaved, in cap um, captivated by the devil, and they do his will. Their minds are slaves of the devil. Their will is under the dominion of the devil. And their affections are entirely swallowed up in the works of the devil. They love and they desire to do his will. Um, and this is the nature of the bondage of the will. Is that their affections are entirely swallowed up by the devil. Their will is enslaved by him. And their mind also is in complete darkness and ignorance. This is the strong delusion that men are under, and they, being in deceit, cannot recover themselves out of it. It is impossible for deceit to uncover itself. How should the devil rule over his people if they were in disagreement with his doctrine? So when we come against these Calvinists, these modern reformed authors, these pastors, these people who are in these churches, can they agree with us? The answer is no, because they are in bondage to the devil. They cannot but serve the devil and do his bidding. Therefore, we are not surprised when they go their own way into hellfire, into damnation and apostasy, because it is impossible for deceit to uncover itself. It is a difficult thing for a man to be saved, to be brought into humility and under the rigor of the law and the strict ordinances of Christianity. It is an impossible thing for man to be saved from his delusion and ignorance. God himself must produce a miracle, and therefore that is the eighth point. Faith, therefore, is a miracle. If you are saved and you understand according to sound doctrine, then you ought to bless God for it, and not bless God but once or twice, but every day, and continually keeping and bearing in mind what he hath done for your soul, because his life is everlasting. He does not give you grace for but a day, or a week, or a year, but he gives life everlasting that grows up and blossoms into the flower, even everlasting life. Just as Thomas Watson says, grace is glory in the bud, and glory is grace in the full flower. If we are to enjoy glory as far as the full flower of paradise, we must be mortified here on this earth. We must be established upon good ground, upon sound doctrine, and we must grow in grace as flowers grow according to their own time. Not in a day, not in a week, but across the whole span of our life, we are growing. We are growing more beautiful in the sight of God, according to as His grace beautifies us, as His grace gives us increase of strength and increase of faith. So, therefore, it is a miracle. As it is impossible for deceit to uncover itself, is ignorance cannot become knowledge, except it is imparted by another um, entity. So God himself must vouchsafe his gospel into our hearts by his own grace, and it is a miracle, because deceit, as it cannot discover itself, requires the omnipotent power of God to wrestle with the conscience and the soul and to bring it to an understanding, because God does not save us against our wills, as it were. Although it is not so much that our wills are free to choose um, righteousness and grace and Christ, or to refuse, but that when God subdues the will to himself, he teaches us sound doctrine by the mind, he shows us that there is no name under heaven given among men by which he must be saved, he shows us the law, our condition in this life, and then he shows us the promise of Christ, and comparing the two, giving us the spirit to see Christ, he gives us also the affections and will to partake of Christ's benefit by choosing Christ. It is not so much that we don't choose Christ, but that we don't choose him by our own natural strength, but that God, by his omnipotent grace, shows us the suitableness of the gospel as a um, meet recovery out of our original nature, and shows us the beauty of the gospel and the promises that follow. And showing that his way is better than the world, we thereby believe unto everlasting life.
And so faith is a miracle, and therefore God deserves glory and praise for the same. Is the Christian life anything else but praising and honoring God? Whether we suffer persecution, whether we read his word or read um, theological treatises based on his word, what is it other than worship? It is us giving ourselves for the sake of Christ who gave himself for us. It is the perfect union and communion between the soul and God, the soul and Christ, and God is glorified by the salvation of his people on behalf of his saints when they give glory to his name and praise him and worship him, not only in his, those exaltations, which are particular acts of of worship with the lips, as the Psalms say many times, praise the Lord, as the final Psalm says, praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with the sound of the trumpet, praise him with the psaltery and the harp, praise him with the timbrel and dance, praise him with the stringed instruments and organs, praise him with the loud cymbals, praise him with the high sounding cymbals, let everything that hath breath, breath, praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. This is a call to worship. God is not only worshipped in these particular acts and words of praise, but also in our declaration of doctrine. Just as when Isaiah says in Psalm 30, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. When we rebuke sin, it is an act of worship. When we call others to worship God uh, in the spirit by the praise of our lips saying praise ye the Lord it is an act of worship when we mortify sin it is an act of worship and therefore our entire lives are to be given to God as a sacrifice just as Romans here says Romans 12 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God the men of this world the Calvinists of our generation the reformed church today has no use of proving what is good and acceptable before God but they rush to stupidity and when they are challenged for it they appear to their own authority and what do you know because you you have not read John Calvin as much as I have an actual quote by Calvinists um, what do you know what could you possibly know but they prove nothing they cannot prove it because it's not true but we are not conformed to this world we are transformed by the renewing of the mind by grace because we are of God that we may prove what is good and acceptable and that perfect will of God and so we are to praise God for the same and live a life of good works pleasing to him. This is the final point. A life of good works pleasing to God is what we do as far as our thankfulness is concerned. What can a Christian do for God? Are we commanded to go door to door and zealously proclaim the gospel to others? This would be of no avail. Like I said before, how are we as human beings to... Um, overthrow the abomination of works that they have piled up, not only in themselves, but in others from the beginning of the world to this day. When you, when you go up against a Calvinist pastor who is learned in church history, you are not going up against a person concerning their own works. They are attached to the works of all other men that came before them. Therefore, when you condemn them and their religion, you are condemning themselves. J.C. Ryle, Charles Spurgeon, Richard Baxter, some of the church fathers as Origen, Jerome, any others who preached gospel, uh, any uh, doctrine uh, contrary to um, the gospel of Jesus Christ as declared in the Holy Scriptures. That which is uh, declared in the Holy Scriptures as the gospel is that which we preach and it overthrows their entire enterprise from the beginning of the world even to their own day. And therefore, if they are to be converted and turned, not only their works must be execrated, but the works that they cling to, their idolatries. And therefore, it is next to impossible, impossible in the spiritual sense, next to impossible in the human sense, to persuade them otherwise. That is why it is said in the scriptures of the Pharisees, not many of the Pharisees, not many of the scribes believed on him. And so, 
although there are extraordinary circumstances, and Christ himself, as a wise pastor and um, shepherd, was able, according to infinite wisdom, to persuade some of the Pharisees to repent, as the conversations of Nicodemus, and Nicodemus being present at his crucifixion, was um, uh, proof of his sincerity. Um, also, it is not for us to imagine that we are going to go and convert others. Therefore, what is that good thing that we are to do in life? What does uh, Solomon say in Ecclesiastes? But fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every secret thing to light, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And therefore... Uh, this is the lesson for today, that the church of God is small, that we are despised, that we are hardly seen by the world, that we are not seen by the world, and our response to God for delivering us from this ignorance, uh, which we were swallowed up in as we lived before a life of ignorance of to God and we were delivered from that to partake of his gospel therefore we can praise God and perform a life of good works pleasing to him and therefore this is a general point it would be superfluous to go and, and declare to every Christian every good work he is to do on behalf of God but these things will come when the time is present but it is enough for us to know that our duty in life is to love God, to love our neighbor, to be busy in the study of God and his doctrine, and to perform that which we ought to according to our vocation and calling. God has called us to a very specific calling as far as our lives are concerned, and it is our duty to perform it with a glad heart and to do it for the glory of God and not for ourselves. And therefore, the lessons we can learn from John Fox's statement here, the nature of true faith being to oppose the works of the devil, faith being of God and not of this world, faith being unifying, faith separating us from ungodliness, only those who are of the church can rightly identify the church, nor can outsiders identify themselves as hypocrites. It is impossible for deceit to uncover itself. Faith, therefore, is a miracle. Praise to God for the same and a life of good works pleasing to him. This is the substance of this statement here, although many particular things in uh, church history were mentioned as far as the superstition that grew. The beneficial and the theological here was mentioned. And this is to our benefit that we heed the word of God, we hear the word of God, and do it. Uh, for God is glorified by the worship of his people in praising his glorious name for what he hath done for us, and when we perform a life of good works in Christ, not for our own glory or our own sake, but because it pleases God, and we understand and know that we deserve nothing for it, because inasmuch as it is performed by us, it is performed with a sinful and duplicitous heart. Inasmuch as it is God's work in us, it is a good work and worthy and pleasing to him. And this is our humiliation and mortification in life, that this humbles us, that we cannot perform good works except God himself give us grace to do them. And therefore, we see as the Puritans write in their sermons over and over again, the Puritans write in their sermons that we often fail in our duty even in the very attitude in which we perform our duty. That every duty we are to perform, whether reading or praying or seeking after God, it must be done with a pure heart, with zeal and fire in our souls, with devotion for God, and with ardency and affection. If we do not do this, it is not serving God aright. And therefore we each see how much we fail in our own duty towards God and we ask for grace to increase in this because this is beneficial not only for these works in particular but for all works and therefore this is the conclusion if faith is a miracle and we then we owe God praise for the same and we owe him a life of good works pleasing to him in zeal and devotion for his name and therefore this is our prayer to increase in grace to increase in strength and to be a benefit to others and if it be his will to advance the kingdom of God on earth. But as it stands in the church today, the church today is apostate and the a true church is hardly seen 
in the world today, just as John Fox himself writes, once again, for although the right church of God be not so invisible in the world that none can see it, yet neither is it so visible again that every worldly eye may perceive it. For like as is the nature of truth, so is the proper condition of the true church, that commonly none sees it, but such only as be the members and partakers thereof. And therefore they which require that God's holy church be so evident and visible to the whole world seem to define the great synagogue of the world rather than the true spiritual church of God. Another important point on this is um, our agreement with John Fox as if we ourselves wrote this. Um, John Fox seems to write our own experience in the world today. It is not so visible again that every worldly eye may perceive it. Like as is the nature of truth, so is the proper condition of the true church that commonly none sees it, but such only as be the members and partakers thereof. And therefore, if we have the faith to believe in God, to believe his word, then it behooves us to give ourselves to him in a life of worship, to praise and glorify his name, because how many millions do we see perishing every day in ignorance, even those who are exposed to the truth? God himself must give us eyes to see, ears to hear, feet to walk, and a heart to worship him in sincerity. And therefore, as he has given us such a heart, so we come before him to pray and to ask that he increase that grace in our hearts, that that fire, which is but a kindling at the beginning, may turn into a glorious flame, one that praises and blesses his name as he deserves and he is worthy of. And so let's conclude in prayer. Our glorious and gracious Father in heaven, thou who alone art worthy to be praised, honored, and glorified, Thou who hast elected us and chosen us for thyself in Jesus Christ from before the world began, who sent thy Son into the world to redeem us from iniquity, and has benefited us with a righteousness not our own, and who has sent thy Spirit into our hearts, granting us the precious gifts of faith and repentance. We thy people do praise thee for thy loving kindness towards us, and thy blessed attributes which are made known to us in the gospel. We praise thee for thy justice, that thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness, that thou art a holy God, and approveth what is good. Why then do the men of this world rage against us when we declare thy name and set forth the demand for purity of doctrine? Is not purity of doctrine proof of a sound mind, which cometh only of thee? But they are unjust and make gods for themselves who accept corruption as righteousness, being devoid of justice and mercy. Destroy them, O God, and deliver us from their cruelty, for they profess to love thee, but it is mere delusion covered in hypocrisy. Save us from ungodly men and act with justice according to thy great work of salvation, that as Christ our Lord hath granted us access into thy presence and a life of peace, communion, and joy with thee through him, even so we might live, because it is promised to us in the gospel. And may we ever bless thy name through him who alone can do it, even Jesus Christ, in whose holy and honored name we pray. Amen.